donnerais bien la parole pour commencer, nous dresser un peu le tableau euh, à Nicolas Véron. Merci, Président. Pour euh, obéir à vos instructions de parler canadien, je vais parler surtout en anglais. Uh, looking back at the period since uh, early 2020, I, I would like to start with the observation of a number of good news. Um, and I think it is remarkable. Of course, the, the pandemic has been a, an incredible tragedy. We had millions of uh, casualties from the virus. This dominates everything. And um, I live in Washington, D.C. In, in Washington, D.C., there is a, an art installation right now on the National Mall, just uh, below the, uh, the Washington Monument, with little flags, one little white flag for each American person who has died from uh, COVID-19 uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's, it's, it's a very powerful installation. So, so I think this should dominate, of course, uh, any perception of what has happened in the last year and a half. But there have been a number of good news, and let me uh, go through uh, a few of them. One of them, which sounds so obvious that we're not debating it in, anymore, but which I think was not to be taken for granted, is that essentially all countries in their public policy reaction to the pandemic have put lives first. Now we know that lockdown strategies are the first response to the virus, especially at the beginning when there was no vaccine. This was not to be taken for granted. China, the country where the virus first appeared, invented an incredibly disruptive strategy when it locked down Wuhan. Now we forget how disruptive that was. When I remember when I learned the news of the lockdown of Wuhan, I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't think it was possible to lock down an entire mega city for health reasons. The Chinese government, a full government, a government that is often accused to put economy before people, put the people before the economy, took a very early decision, very clear one, that they wouldn't uh, let economic imperatives go in the way of protecting lives. I think this is Il a pas de inspiring, uh, despite all the other issues with human rights that exist in China. And it has been emulated throughout the world. Uh, there has been an incredible effort of scientific cooperation. We see, I think, rightly our world as one which is dominated by risks of fragmentation, of decoupling, of escalation between great powers. But if you look at the strategies to mitigate the pandemic and to find responses, thanks to science, they've been incredibly collaborative. The vaccines are the indication of that as well. Vaccines have come incredibly quickly, really without precedent in the history of um, vaccination and healthcare. Uh, of course, there is a lot of inequality in implementation, and this should be felt by each of us as a challenge. We are probably all of us here amongst the first one or two percent of vaccinated people in, on the planet. We should be aware of that privilege. But the deployment of the vaccine, the discovery of the vaccine and its deployment, their deployment, uh, has been, uh, I think, uh, amazingly successful and uh, has been the, the, the real response to the crisis. In political terms, uh, Lionel, you alluded to this, what will this uh, pandemic result in in terms of political trends? Well, Joe Biden was elected president of the United States against Donald Trump. I think if we look, look at the fundamentals and a number of studies, it is very probable, even so we will never know for sure, that if we hadn't had the pandemic, Donald Trump would have been re-elected. And therefore, the notion that hardship creates a ground for populism is not vindicated in the experience we had. And actually, when you look at the European Union, you, you see similar trends. The last election on, in Germany was a, a triumph for moderate centrism. The four main parties that came first this time, center-right, center-left, cent uh, liberals and green, 
increase their total share of the vote. The radical parties on the far left and the far right decrease their share of the vote. Uh, and I, for one, expect something similar to happen next year in my country of France, even so, of course, it's too early to be sure of anything. More importantly, perhaps, the European Union has reacted very vigorously to the threat of the pandemic, which did create risks of fragmentation early on, with this completely unprecedented program of next generation EU, which is not only a lot of money, but for the first time, transfers of that magnitude agreed between member states, and perhaps even more importantly for those of us in finance, for the first time, massive amounts of borrowing directly by the European Union in its own name, which has the potential of creating a new benchmark for markets, a new safe assets, if you will. There have been some auctions where the EU debt has actually priced at the level which is more secure, lower yield than even German sovereign debt of the same maturity. And I think this uh, apparent benign political effect of uh, the pandemic is uh, not only a rich country phenomenon, if you look at the trends, for example, the, the prospects for the Brazilian election, it appears, well, you could say this is, you know, uh, a left-wing populism versus right-wing populism, but I think many of us can agree that uh, Bolsonaro's populism is more disruptive and more threatening than Lula's. And uh, what we see as a prospect for that election, to take only one example among uh, emerging, large emerging countries, uh, is also reassuring uh, for that matter. Now, I don't want to sound like everything is fine in the world. It's not, and I started with the number of uh, deaths and miseries that the pandemic has brought. Let me uh, mention a few uncertainties on the outlook. The first one comes from the virus itself, because the virus is still with us massively, and it keeps mutating, and uh, we're not secure that we won't get a variant that completely changes the equation. So the virus, as it has been the case continuously for the past 20, um, 18 months or more, is the number one driver of the outlook. It's a very short-term driver because it can give us very short-term news, and therefore nothing can be taken for granted at this point. It's a moment, as it has been continuously for 18 months, of very high uncertainty. The response to the virus is a vaccine. That's a sudden uncertainty factor. We've seen reasonably good take-up of the vaccine in a number of countries, but we've also seen it plateauing in some countries, particularly in the US, which started early but has now uh, very low rates of vaccination compared to uh, the potential. And at this point, it's clear it's not due to uh, supply problems. It's due to the low acceptance by population. And it's not only the US. There are many countries, including poor countries, where people are very reluctant to accept the vaccine because they don't trust the authorities. And this is a major risk on the economic outlook because we need people to get vaccinated if we want to get back to a normal economic functioning. Third uncertainty, you mentioned it, Lionel, um, we don't understand supply chains. They react to the current stress in a way that nobody could have exactly uh, foreseen. And we will have more problems with scarcity, with difficulties of adjustment, with the uh, uh, read across in terms of inflation, which frankly I don't think any economist can predict with certainty at this point. I, for one, uh, follow and approve the stance of the main central banks, both the Fed and the ECB. They have a difficult job. I think their current approach makes sense to me, but there can be no confidence that it will be proved to be the right one ex post when we know what will have happened in the meantime. So here again, massive uncertainty. And finally, uh, we mentioned all the pleasant surprises in terms of the rebound and the economic um, outlook it, it looks like now. But there is very high debt everywhere in the world. The debt has increased a lot uh, in rich and poor countries alike. And so we're not well protected against the prospect of a uh, government debt crisis, particularly in poor countries, uh, which has to be a concern going forward uh, continuously. It's been good surprises so far, but I think there could be a number of game changers, uh, not everywhere, but in a number of countries, uh, if uh, conditions become a bit less benign. <laughs>
I'll stop there and look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Uh, I think it was very interesting for, 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 for us to hear you uh, mentioning the, the cooperative, the collaborative uh, response that we have seen in certain cases during this uh, pandemic and also the, the, the speed of uh, the vaccination uh, availability. Uh, even if the African people on this stage, we have a bit of a different view because it has been a very collaborative situation in, in between uh, the major powers and uh, the richest countries and uh, really a shame in terms of international cooperation and remains so in a sense vis-a-vis uh, -vis certain uh, com countries. The, the nationalism in vaccination uh, has been such that uh, even if the African Union has been very well organized in terms of logistics and financing, it has been, in a sense, put out of the market for access to vaccination, to vaccines, which, which is a bit of an issue. Uh, despite that, uh, in terms of the impact, the sanitary impact in Africa, uh, it is less than one-tenth of what has been observed uh, in Europe. Today, uh, it could well become far more uh, uh, dangerous with this very low level of 3% of the African population vaccinated. Um, but there were some elements of, of, of collaboration. You also mentioned that the EU has changed some of its policies and has been, in a sense, efficient. Uh, I would also say that we have seen that on other continents, and again, the African Union, uh, in terms of uh, debt management, for instance, uh, and in the development of the SDR, the droit de tirage spécial uh, distribution, uh, has been well organized and very well organized together with the United, with, with, with uh, the European Union. So th there were some progress in terms of collective governance. I think, which uh, you, you, you have mentioned and, uh, and are important. And you, you, you have mentioned central banks to say that, in a sense, they have been efficient. And you mentioned them about the fact that there is no panic against the inflation of today uh, and more uncertainties. But in a sense, it's monitor, monitored carefully by the, the central bank. I think the central banks have been very important uh, uh, players during uh, this pandemic across the world, uh, even if it's more uh, clearer in OECD or China than uh, in uh, emerging and developing uh, countries. So thank you very much in, indeed. And I think we will come back to this question of uh, inflation. Thank you.